Okay, and it is going live on YouTube right when uh, you just took a sip from a mug. So when did you take a sip from a mug? I have about three seconds to go. Okay, so we have a three second delay. <laughs> we mark it with the mugs. That's Here, how we work right? Through. Five, four, three, two, one. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Welcome to the first ever multi-platform live. We've got about 27 people in YouTube watching. Welcome. Hi, everyone with the Future Fiction Academy. Uh, this is the Future Fiction Academy. I'm Elizabeth Ann West. We also have Steph Pajonas in the house and Leland Artra. And we're here to talk about model sizes and the different models that are out there and how different models are talking about, oh, I'm this many billion parameters. I'm that million billion parameters. Well, what does it all mean? Uh, we also have Christine B in the chat. She's another one of our instructors. And I think possibly um, Karen might be around chatting too. I'm not really sure, but uh, welcome everyone. I'm just going to say some names in the chat that I can see. I see Michelle. Welcome Nicole, Tara, and Stacy. Good to see you. Angie, Tim, Jen, Michelle, Electric, Theodore, and Rachel. Yay, we're so happy to see all of you. If I missed you, I apologize. Oh, Optimistic, I see you too. Welcome. Uh, Steph, do you see anybody in the Facebook group saying hi? Yeah, we got some people in the Facebook group. Uh, Carolyn L. Dean said hello. Hi, hi, girl. Cheers. Oh, I see everybody <laughs> posting there. Very cool. Yay. Fantastic. Okay, so the topic for today. Uh, different models. And uh, so some of you may have been reading about, you know, we know ChatGPT 3.5 and we know ChatGPT 4. So a couple of vocabulary words, I guess, before we get started, um, we will be talking about context windows. So a context window is how many thousands of tokens a model can actually process in one go. And I think the biggest model right now that's commercial is Claude. I know there's one bigger than him, but I have not played with that one yet. Right? Didn't we hear rumors about like a 256 llama, or am I wrong? Uh, well, I think I think you there there is one that's coming out that, that is slightly larger. I don't remember the size though. Was it MTB or something like that? Does that sound familiar? There was one on like hugging chat that was pretty huge. Yeah. yeah. But I'll tell you guys, what I find out is the bigger they are, sometimes the dumber they are. In the sense that when you give Claude. 65,000 words, which is roughly the equivalent of 100,000 tokens. Um, he can give you kind of a report, but he can't nuance it that deep because he also has a restriction, which is the output. And the output restriction for Claude 2, for example, is 4,098 tokens. And I don't think in tokens, so I think in words. It's roughly about 3,000 words. The way you convert tokens to words is just multiply it by 75%. So for every 1,000 tokens, about 750 words is what you get. Um, so any any other models that uh, you guys like to talk about too? Uh, are you talking to the people in chat or talking to us? You guys. I, I, I'm, I'm, mostly, I'm mostly here to talk about parameters with, and, and, and what they mean when it comes to the context. Because um, there's also the, the training model settings and and these other elements that kind of come into come into how the models are actually trained. Yeah, so let's go into that. So we talked about what the models can spit out. Basically, most of the models are stuck spitting out 1,500 to 3,000 words at us um, as a max if you're accessing them through an API or some kind of playground or chat model. Uh, but then we see that they always talk about like billions of parameters and things like that. So if you wanted to take it away, Leland, and talk to us a little bit about what that means, because honestly, I only know that that means like pieces of data that it trained on. Right. OK, well, so, uh, so try and do this quite keep keep this, uh, you know, at, at a fairly easy to understand level. Um, the. The number of parameters are essentially the input variable. So when we when we're talking about. Uh, the inputs to these large language models, we're essentially talking about, we're always talking input in the form of tokens, tokens not, ex not actually being words. And it's because we're trying to determine where a token should be broken up and how it should be taken down uh, into, into something that the computer can use to do its, uh, you know, to do its analysis. Mm -hmm. like, like, for example, take the word aren't, A R A. -A a R E N apostrophe T. Is that one word? Is it two words? Is it are not? Is it aren't? Uh, and how and how do you apply that? So so when you're talking, uh, when the systems are are, are 
taking the inputs from all the various sources that they that where they've gotten their training data from uh, they're they're being broken down into tokens and so when they're talking about how many parameters are going to the models that that's very specifically uh, what was the training data set size so okay. So can I propose a go ahead. Real fast? Can we run over to the tokenizer before we get deeper into this? Because I know you go just talked it. about how words break down, but not everyone's seen that. And I have some nifty tokenizer tricks. So let me go to the... Uh, Show us your tokenizer, tokenizer tricks. You know I love my tokenizer tricks. I, I do. I like a magician when I do it. So I'm going to go ahead and add to the stream so you guys can see this tokenizer. Let me know in the chat if everyone can see this okay or if I need to zoom in a little bit more. Can everyone see it okay? Or do you guys want me to, I think I can zoom in. Why don't you that? zoom in a little bit more just in case. Yeah. That looks great right there. That looks good. All right. I was gonna say, I can read that on my little teeny tiny monitor. <laughs> good, good, good. So what Leland was just talking about, uh, we know that a token is roughly about four characters. And so this is a trick that I show a lot of times. Uh, we could go with, um, we have no bananas for example here. And we can see down at the bottom that this is five tokens. We is a token, have is a token. Um, I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better. Uh, no and bananas and a period is actually a token as well. All of your punctuation marks are a token, but this is just for the humans. The actual computers, what they see is the token IDs. And this goes into vector search, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit on this chat. But these individual numbers here um, are identifying this token, but more importantly, it tells the computer more information than that that we can't see, and that's where this token actually lives inside of the data set, which is a really kind of cool thing to wrap your mind around. And we can see number one, one three right here, 13 is a period. If you are curious about what the zero token is, that is an exclamation point. And if you wanna know what the first token is, we think, oh, not there, because we have to do a different one, hold on. Uh, return is 198, and then um, the, Open quotes is actually token number one. Just some really strange uh, trivia there for you. Now, what's interesting about tokens is that not all words um, are the same token all the time. So let's take the word no, for example, here. In this example, we have no bananas. No is actually six, four, five. We can see that by one, two, three, and we can check our text and make sure one, two, three, the third token there is no. Um, if I was to type in here, you did the dishes in apostrophe no with a question mark. Um, you'll see here that it has the exact same token for no. The problem is, ask yourself, does the no in we have no bananas and you did the dishes, no? Are those the same meaning? And I think most of you are going to go, no. <laughs> at the same time, if I was to tell someone like I'm yelling at them, no you'll see as soon as I put a capital N-O, I get a completely different token ID, which is 15285. Um, so that's just to help explain. And so Leland, what you're saying is that when it says that it was trained on 7 billion parameters, it means 7 billion token IDs, like, correct? correct. Yeah, so it was fed data which had uh, tokens in specific patterns. Right. And that then the model was then, you know, it, it then ran through and created a neural network. This is where we get into the vector stuff. That, that, mm -hmm. uh, and to be perfectly honest, I'd rather have you explain the vectors because you have that, you have that wonderful vector explanation, which <laughs> I, I think, uh, which I, I, I loved it, but I, I haven't practiced it. So how about you explain All right. this? I think mine, mine will work better with computer scientists. So my vector search, and apologies to the computer scientists out there that I'm about to um, offend. So oh, they're going to love this. Trust me. So for this uh, example, I'm going to need a book. And let me go ahead and stop the share of the, um, the tokens and everything so people can see me a little bit better here. And we'll go to this model. Okay. Yeah. You should so probably put your... There we go. I don't know. I, I'm learning how to use StreamYard and, and to control everybody. Uh, let us know if we have any questions or I'm going to check on the chat. Uh, zoom in, please. Okay, so they got to see that. So we did zoom in. Good. Okay, so vector search. So we are used to old searching, which was keywords. Okay, so if you can imagine a box, 
And the old way of searching things was like we'd put a tag on it and that tag would have all the keywords. So we're going to work with fruits and vegetables for this example. And we're going to pretend that we're going to take all of the fruits, the apple, a banana and an orange, and we're going to tag them fruit on them and we're going to shove them in a box. And we'll have broccoli and celery and we're going to tag them as vegetables and we'll throw them in the box. And somebody comes here and says, I'd like a piece of fruit, please. And I go, great. And I rummage in my box and I get everything that has a tag with fruit on it. Now, you guys can really imagine this if you did photo searching. Many of us will search stock photos for like our book covers or something like that. And if you search Eiffel Tower, you get all of the Eiffel Tower pictures, <laughs> some of them more relevant than not. And the only way we could drill down was by adding more keywords and more keywords and more keywords to try to filter it down, right? So everyone's familiar with that kind of search. The new innovation in search is vector search. And what that's going to do, we're going to imagine we have that box again. So just imagine this is a box. I know it's a book, but we're going to we're going to try it anyway. And we're going to take back our we're going to go back to our apple, orange and banana and broccoli example. And this particular book has three dimensions. It's a 3D object. I have a top and a bottom, so that's one dimension. I have a side, a left side and a right side. If that's mirror image, I apologize. So that's a dimension. And I have a front and a back. That's another dimension. So this is a three dimensional object. An actual vector search uh, object for uh, LLMs, it's not three dimensions. It's like infinite dimensions. Imagine it's like a box with a galaxy in it. You can go in all different directions, but that's really hard to understand. So we're gonna stick with three, <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do with a vector search is inside this space of the box, I'm going to assign a specific location for the objects that I'm sticking in the box. And that's what our tokens are. So let's decide we put vegetables on the bottom of the box and fruit on the top of the box. So if you're imagining this box inside of here, we have our celery and our broccoli, they're gonna be closer to the bottom of the box and our apple and our banana and our orange are gonna float somewhere up here. Has everyone got that kind of visualized there? So fruit's kind of floating up at the top in the box and the vegetables, icky vegetables at the bottom. Next, let's decide another parameter that we want to organize this, this galaxy of stars inside of our box. Let's decide one side is acidic and the other side is less acidic. So the less, the less acidic, we're going to have the banana. The banana is suddenly going to move more towards the less acidic. The apple's going to be somewhere in the middle, but more towards the side that's acidic. And our orange is going to be over on the acidic side. So now we've organized the fruit up at the top. And now let's do that, that front to back dimension. Let's decide the front of the box is close, grows closest to the equator. And the back of the box is fruit that grows away from the equator. Suddenly my apple is going to move backwards. It's going to be towards the back of the box because it doesn't grow at the equator. My orange and my banana are going to be at the front of the box, but they're going to be separated based on acidity. And that would just be organizing those items on three dimensions. Imagine if you were organizing 7 billion tokens across a bunch of different parameters. And then you start to understand a little bit what vector search is with LLM. Much better so, than tagging it with keywords. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. And so and so what 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 the what the training does is is it takes takes the these inputs, it does build these networks of relationships between between the various tokens that and the way it's the way that those connections are happening is not three dimensions, it's not five dimensions. It could be 20, 30, 40, 50 dimensions. You want me to share that and, that picture you have? Yeah, go go ahead. I mean all I, right, I, ready I, everyone? I did I did I did a quick search. This is this is a simple <laughs> this is a simplified diagram. Yeah. Uh, for, for one for one of the for for a very, very simple model. Um, and if you can imagine, it just gets even more complex from here. Yeah. So, so when we're talking about the various models, um, when when we're talking about them, like for these large language models, what they've done is they've taken the uh, they've taken uh, a huge amount of free free data that was available on the internet, a whole bunch of public domain works, books, stuff like this, and they push these into these models, and they've done that where they they've they've Put them together, and so when we're talking about GPT like three, GPT three has 175 billion parameters. That's Da Vinci, that, by the way, for our people. Yeah. Uh, who who uh, are da Vinci. who are used to calling it Da Vinci? Oh, Da Vinci. Okay. Uh, and then like GPT four, had when they first released it, they didn't want to tell anybody, but it ha it has been finally confirmed. GPT four has 1.76 trillion parameters. 
Okay. So it is 500 times larger than GPT-3. So um, basically, because we live in the Milky Way galaxy, is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So if GPT-3 is a galaxy like the Milky Way, GPT-4 like ma or magnitudes is like a universe. Yeah, I... I I'm not. I, I'm sorry. My astrophysics is not at the level <laughs> of, of Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think Tyson. it's pretty close. Um, I think she's in close. layman's terms. I, I think yeah. So I think we we could probably get there. I mean, GPT four is all is is uh, yeah. Okay, it's it's definitely the full universe. Might even be two universes. Um, but so that and that's just that's just the tokens. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the in the machine learning space. Um, the data is is sliced up, is fed into these things, and then the system is somewhat self-trained through a series of very specific examples. So what the connections actually are and how they are related is actually something that is currently unknown. So the fact that these things are working is almost a surprise to, to, to the scientists who are using it. Do you mean is, unknown to us or unknown to the people who are actually like... Unknown writing? to the people who are actually using it. So the, 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 It's the, like the, magic. It, oh. it, the, the people in OpenAI and the people in Anthropic... It explains so much right now. They, they, <laughs> they cannot... They, you cannot reverse engineer this. We can't, we can't like, like, it's not like a car where you can open the hood and you can start disassembling the engine and seeing how all the connections are. They can't see that. It's it, it, there. We do not have a means. We actually don't even have the language to explain some of the relationships that's happening. This is why, for example, uh, it was a complete shock and surprise when Google's uh, early AI system um, it invented its own language. So the Google translation system is, is essentially a machine learning system, which is based on, on the same stuff. Um, and what it did was is, is they expected it to translate from English to Spanish, from Spanish to French or whatever, right? But it turns out what the, what the, what the, 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 the model that actually worked, they found out that it was actually translating the languages into another language that doesn't exist. Right. It, it invented its own language. It translates everything into that language and then translates from that language back out into whatever language, you know, is the destination. So it created it's actually, like an intermediary step. Right. right. Between and, and, the two of them. And they, and there's actually some linguists. I, I my understanding is that there's some linguists out there that are currently having all kinds of fun exploring the language that it invented. <laughs> we are having a couple of questions here about um, the some comments here about so the fact that it's all magic. Yep. And that it kind of the fact that they can't explain the the interconnections and the relationships that it's a bit like our brain. Like sometimes we can't explain our thought processes. We just know how we arrived at the final thing, but I can't necessarily walk you through it. And one other quote here from Rachel Heller. Uh, saying any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic art, <laughs> yes. which is very helpful. So, uh, Leland, do you think because they they couldn't really explain the interconnected and stuff like that, that's why they jumped to call it AI rather than distinguishing it as generative AI versus what most people think well, of it's, AI it's, being sentient? It's more that it, it's more that we don't have a we do not actually have a term for what this is. So. So there's a the generic term is artificial intelligence, and the whole point behind this is is, to, is it was it came out of research that was specifically being done to pass the Turing test. All of this was to try and come up with some type of artificial model that could pass the Turing test, which would then be defined according to Alan Turing as intelligence. Mm -hmm. But we're not there yet. So this is this is not yet an intelligence. This is a, a word slot machine quite literally. Yeah, I call it a dictionary slot machine all the time. Right. There's no database. That's what, where I think like a lot of the anti-AI people in the writing world come up from. They're like, it's theft, it's plagiarism, it's, it's, it's copying and pasting. And I'm like, there is no copying and pasting. It's literally predicting the token, which I can do another field trip if we wanted to take a look at DaVinci 3, basically selecting the next token, or if you have something set up that you wanted to share next. Well, so, so, one of the things that one of the things that that, that, that I do want to explain though is, is is that for this training set they they put in the training data so the training there's the parameters then there's also what's known as the hyperparameters 
-hmm. Now the hyperparameters are essentially the dials and sliders right. on a mad scientist's uh, laboratory. Um, all the knobs and all the, the, <laughs> all the knobs and stuff like that. And what they have been doing is they have been changing some of the settings, running the system through, and then they have some test data that they that have that they're like, okay, we're going to ask it these ser this series of questions and see what the results look like. Mm -hmm. And if the if the results don't look right, they they literally throw that away and they do it again. And 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 so they they're it, this is a uh, you know try try try. Oh, this is working. Keep it. Now, right. I have found that, too, with like our prompting work that we do in the Future Fiction Academy, because we teach prompting and labs and stuff like that. And I've had to teach starting to teach people like a prompt may work and then it suddenly not work. And it's not the prompt's fault and it's not your fault. It's literally like it picked a wrong token and it went down a rabbit hole and there was no because the AI can't go back and revise itself. It can only go in one direction. It can only go top down. It doesn't think. So it's I've doing a form of cryptology, right? So, I mean, so all of the, all of the research into breaking crypto, crypt, you know, uh, cryptograms and mm -hmm. ciphers and stuff like that, that's what it's doing. It's doing word frequency analyses. It's, it's got predictability. It's like, if I see this token and that token together, then, then there's like a percentage chance of the next three, you know, and it, 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 these associations are essentially predictions of what comes next let's go ahead and show that real fast for people who who need a visual is that okay and then you can show what, the oh the uh, the little thing i got it no not not that thing but i was going to show in um playground the oh yeah uh, go ahead yeah, yeah. yep so we're back to our uh, our open ai platform and i'm actually going to go to the open ai playground so when you go to open ai now and you log in you get the option of ChatGPT, Dolly, or a or the API. I'm going to go to the API, which gives you access to the playground right here. The playground is a developer tool. Um, it used to go straight into completion mode. That was the origin. Now it defaults into chat. Um, this is free, by the way. You can get an account here, and then you pay by the usage, as opposed to like ChatGPT Plus, where it's twenty dollars a month. So I'm going to go to completion mode, which is a legacy mode in the top right. Well, let me pause you right here, yep. real quick. So in this model, very seriously, in, mm -hmm. the, in, in the field, the, the, the input window where you're going to put, where you're going to type in what you're going to type in next, Here. that is quite literally the parameters. So, so think about this. That is the parameters. Yep. All the stuff down the right-hand side of your, of your screen there, those are, those are the hyperparameters. Yep. Those are the the sliders and the knobs that can adjust the behavior of the, the system um, that will impact the results. Mm -hmm. that, and, and, and what we're doing is the model has been taken to a certain point with, with the training and then locked in. Yes. So, so the model has gotten to this point and now we're going to put in a little bit more and play with the bell, play with the knobs and, and dials, and we're going to get a little bit more out. We're right. Take it, take it one more step. So we'll, you guys we'll, will see temp temperature. Almost every single large language model we have out there is they call it a temperature, and I think it's the dumbest word ever <laughs> because <laughs> what it really means is how much do you want the large language model to be literal in its interpretation of your prompt, or how random do you want it to be? So if you bring your temperature all the way down to like hardly nothing, and I say describe a rose bed, and I click submit. Do you have your, uh, yeah, can you do? It has a chance of just like, it, it has a really good chance of just going like to spinning. It's going to sound like, a, it's going to sound like an encyclopedia. A rose bed is a garden bed filled with roses of various colors and varieties. The roses are usually planted in neat rows and can be surrounded by a low fence or wall. It's going to be very deterministic, um, very like the kind of thing like you would expect in Wikipedia. A Wikipedia and you will also like. notice that it's all green and green. Yeah. And, and this, in this case, the you know. No, nope, I don't have it on. I, I didn't have it on. I didn't have the spectrum on. So it's just green to show you the completion. Oh, I, try it I, again. I, I'll run it again. Now I deleted what I Give had. Give me the spectrum. I deleted what I had on purpose because it has a context window. So if I left that in there, it would, that would be part of the prompting that would skew it um, in its response. 
it would take that into consideration. So now we see some different colors here. Now, again, mm -hmm. my temperature is still like 0 0.09. And we can see here this beautiful token right here. And when lovely I, pastels. Yes, the lovely pastels. Apologies to anyone who's colorblind. But basically, this beautiful is slightly, it's like an orangey color compared to the green. So a rosebed is a, those four tokens were all green. They were all the most, most expected token to happen. This beautiful slightly orange, because even though it was the highest percentage here at 25.82%, um, it, it was really close to garden. So they were kind of like, mm, could be either one. We could have said a rosebed is a garden, like a garden feature, or a rosebed is a beautiful something. Um, go go, go to the here? bottom, Elizabeth. Yep. Last row, far right, rosebed is two tokens. Show right that. here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we have rose was 35.58%. And then the bed was 96.16%. But this calculation does not mean that bed always goes after rose. It means that calculation was based on the token so far in the prompt. It's a calculation that's done on the fly. So for those of you who hated math class and like pages with pages of math, this thing did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like ten calculations in a split second for one sentence. Right, Leland? Because it just it calculates yes. and then it calculates again for the next token. Then it takes those two tokens into consideration for the next token. Yep. Let's and, see what it, 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 and it's literally just randomly picking. Now yeah, throw that temperature all the way to the other side of the thing. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's, let's go crazy. All right, I'm, I'm deleting back all of my trailing spaces because that's another thing that can throw you off. When you're doing these kinds of like runs to, to see different parameters and things, you want to try to do the same things over and over again. It broke. <laughs> yeah. Flashed grounded core. <laughs> and and it, all red. Yeah, that was just completely random. So basically it picked 0%, 0%, 0%. Right. So, it, it went after the it went after the the most unlikely thing to come next, and it literally ran out of stuff because it didn't have anything else more unlikely to come. What you actually hit there is you literally hit the edge of the universe of parameters. Of the parameters. So this is why most of the time your temperature is one, and when your temperature is one, and uh, it thinks it's running right now, and I submit it. So a temperature of one. You get this nice balance. You get this thing where, you know, you're going to get space thrown in, which was a 0.05%. But we didn't end up with like temperature two where the whole thing was just broken. Um, then the other parameters that you can change here, maximum length is how much it how much it responds back. A stop sequence is for if you have a specific word that you want it to stop completing on. Uh, top P is just how many different uh, parameters it, like whether it looks at all of the possibilities or if it only looks at like half of them. Frequency and pen presence penalty. Now, this is kind of interesting. These are hard to explain. I have always struggled with it, but it's it's whether or not a frequency will penalize a new token based on the existing frequency in the text so far. So it's adding it's adding like a little bit of an extra calculation each time it's doing the tokens. So it's going to decrease the model's likelihood to repeat the same line verbatim. Um, and then your presence penalty will actually penalize new tokens based on whether they appear in the text so far. And it increases. Now they've changed the, the lines here because this, this literally says how much to penalize new tokens based on their existing frequency in the text so far. And this is how much to penalize new tokens based on whether they appear in the text so far. So what I find when I'm writing fiction is I like my presence penalty to be at one because I find that it will go to a new word more, more likely than um, it, if it's at zero. A lot of times if it's at zero, I'll have the same words over and over and over again uh, for, for general things. Anything else, Leland, that you wanted to show on this? Um, no. So frequency penalty and, and presence penalty are essentially multipliers. So what happens is is, is once a token is, is generated, uh, the presence penalty goes up a little bit because it's present. Yep. And then the frequency, if, if the same token is used again, then the frequency penalty is multiplied against the presence penalty. So what that does is that it says the more something shows up, the harder we're going to push to not have it show up. Right. Which, and that's why we have both of them at one. They cancel each other out? Uh, no, they, they don't cancel each other out. What they do is they, uh, they, they essentially give you um, – they, they, they essentially set it so that the uh, 
uh, once something shows up, it's only going to show up maybe two, maybe three times mm -hmm. at most. And what that does is that says, okay, well, even though there may not be anything good to come after something, right? So, like, if if you're if it's generate if it's trying to generate um, a sentence or give you some decent grammar, if those settings are too high and something has already been like like if like for example, if you're talking about a specific genre, and so yep. in that article it's mentioning that genre a lot, and you have those those hyperparameters turned up it's literally going to run out of ways to describe the genre you're talking about because it's like, I can't, I just can't go any further because right. the value gets too high and then, it, and then it goes off the rails and starts so hallucinating. Let's, let's move presence penalty up to, let's go all the way max. Let's go all the way to two and let's try the describe a rosebud because I wanted to show something else real fast. So if we do describe a rosebud, now we'll see, um, I'm seeing a lot more orange and red than what we were seeing before uh, with just our temperature at one. Are you seeing kind of the same thing? Mm -hmm. And that's where you can see that we have some weird stuff here where like it just randomly decided to capitalize rose in the middle of a sentence. So that's a mistake and that's an issue. Um, and that's literally because it doesn't think. It knew that capital rose was a 0.03%, but because my presence penalty is high, it couldn't really do the lowercase rose. So it went to this weird uppercase rose. Well, uppercase rose is associated with lowercase rose. They're not the same. As far as, I mean, right. it, do, it does not understand. But it already had rose one different. more one time here. Right. So it doesn't, it, 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 uh, it has rose bed, right? Rose, is rose bed one word? No, nope, this, this is two, this is two, uh, it doesn't, it's two tokens. It's two tokens. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's they what are we're talking about like my presence penalty was a two. So since lowercase rose was already here, that that messed up this calculation, which probably should have been just a lowercase rose. And instead it went to the 0.03% because my presence penalty is at the highest. Yep. Because it penalized lowercase. You don't even see, yeah, lowercase rose, it put it 4.65% right here. So that's where your presence penalty can cause some issues, but it's also can be what you want it to be because this is describe a rosebed. There's one other thing I wanted to show. The most powerful, going back to what Leland was saying, these are hyperparameters. They're helpful, but the real heavy lifting comes with your prompting. So if I say describe a rosebed, we've been getting a lot of like encyclopedia uh, responses, right? So let's, let's zhuzh it up. Let's be actual fiction authors for a second. Let's describe a rosebed that was neglected for 20 years down in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, next to a mausoleum. Let's see in, what we get. In 1890. Oh, in 1890. Even better. Submit. The rosebed nestled next to the mausoleum in New Orleans had been neglected for 20 years as of 1890. The plot was thick with a mix of wild grasses and ivy that completely overtook the barren soil as only a few of the original rose bushes in the garden were still clinging to life. Once vibrant in appearance, the abandoned landscape had become overgrown with thick foliage, giving it an almost sinister appearance in the moonlight. The only source of light came from within the mausoleum stone walls, a reminder of the shadows that loom overhead. The few remaining roses in the garden were withered and sad, their petals and leaves long gone. The wild, sweet-smelling flowers of the south had been replaced by the saturated smell of humidity. As the sun rose in the sky above, oh, take a drink. It talked about the sun. <laughs> it began to melt away the quiet of the forgotten garden, exposing the old beauty of the neglected rosebed. And the last thought I'll leave you guys with before I, I stop the share you cannot raise your presence penalty to the point that you're going to get good material out of this. You have, like, it was never. Presence penalty on two was never going to bring me mausoleum, New Orleans, Louisiana, 1890. That has to be you. That's the you part that you bring in with the LLMs. That's the real power. It's not trillions of parameters. We have up here, like, I don't know, a bigger word than a bigger number than that one, because we actually have the lifetime experience and stuff to, to, to think temporally and things like that. So that's the last little bit I would share. I didn't mean that be so deep, but, but that's my point. Like the prompting is really the heavy lift, which is what you were saying, right? Leland that yes. what you put in the box. So I'll take that down. And do you want to share the cute little Wally bit now? No, hold on one second here. Okay. Um, yeah. I, let me, sh yeah, I'll be glad to. Let me, I'll check the chat real fast. Anything let me clear on my screen. 
Nothing on Facebook currently. Nope. I've been answering anything that comes up there. Okay. I'll answer some on YouTube. Trying to bring some flavor. They're asking, uh, why is everything in New Orleans so sinister? And they're saying... That one made me laugh. <laughs> I, I blame Anne Rice. I blame Nicole. <laughs> right? <laughs> just trying to bring some flavor. That's all. But that's the point. It just isn't mm -hmm. going to... Um, it, it's not, it's not going to bring that in naturally with those parameters and everything like that. It can't think. It can't go, you know, unless you prompt it and say, hey, you have permission to go wild and come up with a really wackadoo thing. Um, we had some crazy prompting in some of the classes I've done where I've taught all about um, one time we wrote a short story based on a recipe, uh, a step-by-step -step instructions to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it turned it in, we turned it into a horror one. We turned it into a contemporary romance and the AI just ran with it. It was like, cool. I have these extra parameters. Here I go. Now I can write a unique story. So I have some interesting parameters to play with. Go ahead, Leland, if you're ready. Oh, you need me to share it? Uh, hold on here one second. I'm just I'm just changing a couple settings here to, to, to hide something. I go. see you. Okay. I know, well, you know I when know you're you ready to go. Say. Okay. Uh, just keep in go. mind not everybody has those capabilities. I Actually, they do now. Um, All right. Good? Yep, yeah, I'm good. So All right. Gonna, Add in string. Show. Okay. So, so what I'm going to demonstrate to you is something that none of these large language models can do. All right. You might recognize this particular scene. It's a little clip. So, so it's a very short little quip. You remember it's, it's from a little movie from Pixar called Wally, -E, and it's like all of a sudden he's trying to associate something, and he puts it in the middle. This is by far one of the most interesting things that uh, they 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 did because what that shows is that shows that Wally -E is not just following his program. He's not based off of just his inputs and controls. He's actually able to think, which makes him a genuine AI as opposed to as opposed to uh, one of these large language models. There's other instances in that movie, too, where he's actually clever. Um, that's yes. why he's so endearing to us, uh, where he solves a whole host of different problems. Um, and it almost kind of makes the idea in that movie that he's the only one to develop this because all the other robots basically came to a stop. Like, Well, he starts, he starts infecting. The, like, he infects Eve. Yeah. Even yeah, we so, can talk. We can have a long talk about the. Movie. We can have a long talk about Pixar, <laughs> but the whole point is, is while there's in fact a virus uh, of, of of intelligence that affects the other, that starts mm -hmm. affecting the other things, right? Um, but but that but the but the whole thing is is that this whole this whole system is set up to do this. So for example, if I'm in Chat GPT and I'm just like, um, I need the detective to find a clue. Uh, give me five sample clues for a robbery, right? So, I mean, very generic, absolutely nothing of any use. Um, no context there either. You didn't tell it what you didn't tell it you were writing a story. You didn't tell it anything. You just said... Just Detec this. Detective James Brin might discover a robbery in 1930s London monogrammed handkerchief, a muddy footprint, a broken watch chain. Now, it does have some context because I'm cheating a little bit. I do have custom instructions turned on, which is essentially setting it to a Pulp Fiction set in London in the 1930s. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, that, the, the, the prompts that I am using are very specifically eliminating quite literally like more than you know, three quarters of all of the training data that is in GPT-4. It's all, it, like the moment my parameter hits the system, it immediately dismisses three quarters of its training data. It's just all gone it, it, because what's happening is, is the, the prompt is directing it to some section of its parameters where, and then it starts looking for some of these things. Now it might look like it's thinking it might, it, it, you, 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 the problem with these things is it's really easy to believe that these things are thinking, but they're not. So it, this is this is out of all the Pulp Fictions, uh, the the things that the things included in was I clue detective. Um, the the five samples are is is something that's, that's being used uh, in the kind of the loop system that's that's processing the the thing, so it knows it's it's looking for that one. 
But essentially, I'll tell you, it's detective, clue, and robbery. And then out, out of the out of the custom instructions that are into it, it's 1930s London. And that and the thing is, that you'll see it even comes back with five sample clues that Detective James Brim might discover while investigating a robbery in 1930s London. So it just tells you flat out. These are the things that I, I, worried about. I, I targeted mm -hmm. because it also realizes that the tokens for the word to and I and the uh, and, and me. for and a those are all those tokens all are basically meaningless. And, and as part of the processing of the of my input data to to start the quest down the neural network path, it just threw those all away. However, it's still helpful to prompt with them, correct? Because that's how yes. it was trained. It was trained with those in there. So sometimes if you if you were just to say, de like if you were to go caveman with it and go detective, clue, uh, could you scroll up a little bit? I lost the keywords already. Robbery. Yeah, if we went, if we went caveman with it and we went detective, clue, five, five robbery, it wouldn't know what the heck to do with that. It's a oh, natural okay. language processor. Can we try, can we try caveman? Say Detective. Detective. You got to do the caveman voice. Detective. Detective. Clue. Robbery. Five. 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 That's it. That's uh, it. That's it. That's it. That's all. Give me. <laughs> it's it, like you're it is a natural clue. language processor on top of, of a large language model. So it's trying to look for natural language in order to so it make wrote decisions. A yeah, it wrote us a story. <laughs> Because it doesn't know that yeah, you're looking no for something. Well, and so again, what it's doing is it's actually pulling in my st my stylization stuff, which is in this stuff. So yeah, I have I I have I have about three thousand characters worth mm -hmm. of style control prompts that are being wrapped into everything that I'm doing. Now, I did this kind of on purpose because I also want to talk a little bit about Poe, because when you're dealing with some of the um, generative AI tools that are out there, like PseudoWrite, Poe, Poe.com, uh, po uh, Novel AI, all these other ones, they have additional prompting and controls. And they're, what they're doing is they're basically taking what you give them, they're wrapping that up in a nice, cute little package, and then they're, they're giving that to these generative AIs with these extra with this extra data around it so what you get back uh with like pseudo write or novel ai is very specifically fictional story stuff because their prompts are are pushing the engine to get to be all about generating fictional Fiction uh, language right words words of fiction um poe.com is actually a little bit more businessy um and so it it's trying to come back with stuff like this now all of the research and all the big money in these generative AI systems is being directed at business solutions, meeting notes, meeting things, transcripts, uh, navigation controls, real world solutions, medical ex research, expert systems. And all. I, actually, I got started in this industry through medical research back in the 90s. That's how I got into the, the machine learning uh, processing uh, was when I was doing research at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff is, is, is in there. And these engines and these systems that are being, are, are, are being handed out by the vast majority, I'd say 99% of the people who are using these systems are not using them to generate fiction. They're using them to give me a list of five things to do today. Uh, I have these six things in my grocery seat. They're, they're asking it real okay. world problems and trying to get real world answers. What's that, Elizabeth? That was my bad. I tried to answer a question on Facebook and it started talking. And so there was like overlap. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Well, that's no fine. worries. I'm handling it. Okay. So um, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought. But anyways. So it's okay. The, we were, the, we're fine. The, the fact, the fact of the matter is, is none of the words that you're going to get, none of the words that you're going to get out of this thing came from anywhere other than a random word bag. Wow, it, has a, it, has, it has a bag of words. It's just pulling words out. The, but the, the thing is, is that the system has been, it's looping. So it's actually doing it like four or five times. And the reason it's doing that is because it's, these things have been designed to pass the Turing test. 
the things that they're being tested with are bar ex- like the lawyer bar examination, the medical, uh, you know, medical, the, the doctor's tests. They're, they're being tested against um, these known difficult problems that require language skills in order to properly articulate the answer and get the correct response. And they're being fine tuned and pushed down those roads. So, so I have a field trip proposal. Field trip. Let's let's do a magic school bus. Magic school bus. Okay. So we've already gone through about how this thing, how the large language models work as far as tokens go. And we've looked at the tokenizer. We also talked about how many trillion and billion parameters, like you say, Da Vinci 3 is 175 billion, right? Yes. And GPT-4 is something in the trillions? Uh, 1.7 trillion, yes. Okay. So I would like to propose we do two tests with the Rosebud and also your uh, detective 1930s crime in London robbery thing. And let's take a look at one of these smaller models. I was going to do a a field trip to Hugging Chat, and we're going to go take a look at a 7 billion parameter and a 13 billion parameter, since the whole purpose of this talk was, does bigger mean better? Sure. Okay. Well, okay. So the answer is, is actually smaller can mean way better. I know. Um, (laughs) Would you not ruin it? Would you stop it? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's doing the big reveal ahead of time. He did. Uh, he totally I, did. I, I, I love explaining stuff. So so the fact of the matter is, is, is if, I, if I could come up with a way to take one of these smaller language models and upload my little over 500,000 words books into them, along with uh, a few Pulp Fiction concepts, stuff like that. I would have a large language model that would be useless for everybody else, but would be fantastic at generating um, the fictional words I want in my universe. Well, hold that thought because we're planning on testing that with Rexy. Go for it. So, 3.5 so, Turbo. So uh, did you take me off the share? I'm off the share. Good. Okay, yeah, so you're off the share. Um, so that's, we do have, uh, we, if you watched the write-a-thon I did last week on our YouTube channel, um, Rexy is our custom proprietary prompting tool that is coming to the FFA. We have some alpha testers in the house in YouTube and everything like that. He's remarkable. He's lovely. He's my favorite dinosaur. Um, he has the ability to basically use your API keys for open AI or anthropic or novel AI and run prompts for you. And we have a whole prompt library and we're working on sequencing. So things can be looped, um, all that, all that fun stuff. And earlier this week, it just got announced that 3.5 is now eligible for fine tuning. And OpenAI is working on an interface that will allow people to very quickly do a fine tune. And as soon as we have the abilities to do that and to share showcase that with you, we promise we'll be back with a live just to talk about fine tuning. <laughs> uh, but right now, uh, I took us to Hugging Chat. Huggingface.co is a repository, kind of like GitHub. And it has a bunch of different open source large language models. So we've been focusing on kind of the big ones, Claude, OpenAI, although we really haven't played with Claude very much tonight at all. Um, Claude is another big, big model, just like uh, OpenA- OpenAI's ChatGPT and everything. But we have some competitors coming into the space, more specifically um, Llama, which is uh, from Meta, who you'll know owns Facebook. And this one, this model right here, it tells me that it is um, 70 billion parameters. So this is much smaller than Da Vinci. And there's other models available too. So that's the newer one that came out. If I, if I click this to, to see a different model, I think it's kind of running slow because I'm streaming, I guess, would be the only thing I could think of here. But there is a smaller one, I think that's 13 billion. But we'll do the 70 billion just so that, it, so that it's easy. And uh, let's go ahead and go... Uh, describe for me, describe, I think it was just describe a rosebed was the information that we gave it. So I'm not going to give any uh, extra information there other than that. And we'll click go. And it works just like the other chats if it's working. It wasn't loading very fast for me earlier. So let me try refreshing my page. Okay, let's try this again. Describe a rosebed. Okay, channeling space, and then we click go. Why is it not liking me? New chat. This is the the hazards of going live, right? There we go. Okay. Now we've got it. A rose bed is a garden bed dedicated to growing roses. It typically consists of a raised or sunken area of soil surrounded by borders. So we got more information here. Um, One thing that you guys might like about Hugging Chat is that it does have the ability to search the web. 
So if I can, I can ask it, if I do search the web, um, give me ways to keep my rose bed healthy. I know we're, we're deviating from our original prompts, but you can see it's doing a web search and it decided there was nothing on the web. <laughs> so not the most accurate here. It just didn't come up with anything. Searching Google, an error occurred. I'd have to look at my settings. I may not have it set up right to do it. But it does have some tips for the rose bed to be healthy. Um, I would expect these or similar results if I was to prompt DaVinci or 3.5, actually. Actually, this is more like 3.5 Turbo. Um, you'll see here that this is a smaller model than what DaVinci is, but it gave me three paragraphs of information. Um, so just because it says it's how many billion parameters does not necessarily dictate performance of the model. Let me go a new chat and let's do your detective one. Sound good, Leland? Yeah, well, actually, I just I just did it. So what do you mean you just did it? Are you sharing your screen, too? No, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sharing the screen to you. But OK, I'm sharing my screen to you. But I I actually grabbed my I actually grabbed the style guy and put the whole thing all in there. So into hugging chat, because I see you on chat GPT. Yeah, I'm on ChatGPT, right? So okay, I, I, no, I did chat... to test it on hugging chat. Okay, well here, so I'll, let me give you. We're having a who's on first moment. <laughs> okay, just just read it out to me. I'm not going to do the whole context thing. Let's just do the um, give me what was it? Five clues a detective might find at a robbery in London. And what was the year? 1930s. 1930. And I'm going to say this is for a Pulp Fiction. I'll give it that context. Pulp Fiction, what, mystery? Yeah, that'd be good. That's enough. Yeah, there we go. And we'll go says story, just so it knows. So it doesn't try to give me an accurate one. So it's generating. Hopefully it's not going to moralize and be like, I cannot do this. This is against my religion. Yeah, I love it when they do that. <laughs> I I can't possibly write fiction. I'm an AI. Okay, well, this is for a fictional book, and I need your help to do it. Okay, here you go. <laughs> so much fun. My favorite is when it says I won't write a romance scene, so then I just start writing the romance scene, and I say what happens next, and it gets dirtier than I was going to write it. But it won't do it. I think I think we have a, an issue again. Um, hugging chat is free at the moment. So one thing you'll find with the free AI tools, sometimes they don't work as well. Give me five clues a detective might find uh, a robbery in London, 1930s. This is for a pulp fiction mystery story. And then just to make sure we are nice and safe, I'm time before I send it. Of course, now it'll work just fine. That's how that works. Can you paste that into a private chat the robbery? Because I just lost it. <laughs> I was actually going to. I was actually going to type that. I've turned off. I've turned off all my extra settings, and I was just. Oh, I see. We were going to go head to head. I see. I see. Yes. 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 Okay. So I think I have to go to the so chat. We have a here. we have a private chat amongst we us or something. Do you like have that. a private chat? I just. Oh, I see it now. There. There we go. Magic. I pasted yes. it in. Okay, I'm copying it. I'm just going to put it in here. So I'm just going to do three five. So this is. Should I put it in Claude? I can put it you, in you, Claude. Yeah. You can yes, let Claude. me do it in Claude. That's a good idea because then we'll share yeah. all the screens because. Uh, so then we have three, five, Claude, and then Elizabeth, you can do. Actually, uh, I have four. Claude right here. So, Steph, because you're not sharing your screen yet. So, we'll run it in Claude. Can I you guys see so. Claude now? Yeah. Okay, so we'll it. run it in Claude. Here are five clues the detective might find in 1930s robbery, London robbery scene. A crushed bowler hat nearest the smashed window where the thief entered. It likely belongs to the robber. A torn piece of tweed fabric caught on a jagged edge of broken glass could be from the robber's jacket. An empty leather billfold monogrammed with the initials JH discarded in the alley, probably Ooh. stolen off the victim. But you know what? I remember your initial one before we went caveman on it. It had initials on a handkerchief being a dandy. Yes. But monogramming was big in that time period. So it makes sense. Absolutely. A handwritten note with a Cockney rhyming slang threat to the bake manager provides insight into the criminal's background and a receipt from a nearby pub for a pint purchase an hour before the crime. Did they do receipts in 1930s? Gives yes, the they detective did. a time frame to investigate. Yeah, they actually had receipts in the 1930s. They actually um, had receipts in the 1870s. I don't know why Hugging Chat doesn't want to play along. I think it's decided... Oh, there we go. Okay, we finally got Hugging Chat to play. What's really Wait. funny is... GPT-35, the first one was a monogram cigarette case. Yep. Uh, followed by fading perfume, scent, discarded pocket watch, muddy footprints, and torn, 
torn well, telegram. Let me, I'll add to stream yours so that they can see yeah. the chat GPT. So, so, so was this 3.5 or four? This is 3.5. Okay. So, uh, the initials HW theoretical, you know, the case seems like fading perfume scent, a lingering trace of perfume, which is really funny because I actually just, I just used the fading perfume, perfume scent in my other novel, uh, discard a pocket watch, muddy footprints, torn scrap of a telegram. Now that's three, five. The next, this next tab over here is four, same exact one monogram cigarette case. Apparently. So he's a look at that. So monogram cigarette case is actually on both. Yep. Trolley ticket stub, boot print. So it's a boot print versus a muddy boot print. Right. Clipping from a local newspaper, a sound of a distinctive whistle. That, that one's interesting. That one's kind of like out there. So the differences between 3.5 and 4 are actually not that far off. And this is this is with everything turned off. So this is just the straight up model without, any, without anything further. But yeah. as you can see, now here's the thing. Playing with these tools in this chat mode, my hyperparameters are fixed. They're they're fixed, and there's a little extra training. So these models are getting updated about once every once every week or two weeks, with some additional safety measures, a few extra things that are being put into place. And their performance is going to be relatively uh, stable with regards to to getting work out of it. And the thing is, if if you ask it a question. And you don't like the answer, ask the question again. Don't don't just go, oh, I must have asked the question incorrectly because uh, you might just got a bad random draw. Yeah. I have yeah, one there's more. There's a lot of randomness to this. So you might as well just keep asking and asking until you get something. Oh, it was running and it crashed? No, okay, it's running. Okay, there it goes. So here is what uh, Hugging Chat, this is Llama. Um, which is five clues the detective might find at a robbery scene in London during the 1930s, a discarded cigarette pack with a distinctive logo or design that can be traced back to a specific brand or store. The detective might also notice if there's any unusual particles or residue on the packaging that could provide additional leads. A piece of torn fabric caught in a window latch or door handle. Now that's similar to what Claude had with the torn tweed. Torn, ugh, what a tongue twister. Torn tweed on the window. The, the fabric could have come from the perpetrator's clothing and its texture, color, or pattern could help them. Now, I will notice that that's kind of like the difference I see between these smaller parameters, like the 70, I mean, 70 billion. It doesn't necessarily always have those richer details of like tweed or the actual type of fabric that would make sense for the 1930s. And that kind of makes sense because that may not have been in the training data. Um, a fingerprint. Uh, a rare coin, antique locket, or a valuable object that doesn't seem to belong in the location where it was found. Now, I haven't seen that on any of the models yet. Have you, Leland? No. No. I, well, I mean, yes, actually, uh, one of them had a, uh, like, the very first time I ran it with a little bit extra stuff, I actually got back a, a discard, I got a discard pocket watch among gotcha. the degree. And I have one more parameter for us to do, and that is, oh, dear, they've changed it. Okay, let's look at Google Palm, Palm the, run, the last one real fast, and let me clear my chat. This little broom thing here clears the chat. We'll throw this into Google Palm. I'm not sure what the parameters are Palm 2 are, but that was fast. Um, I think this one's really small. Do we know information about the chat too? By it's actually, small, but it's very fast. It's, it's very super fast. fast. Super fast. Now, this one came up with a single playing card, the Ace of Spades left on the ground next to the safe. A footprint in the soft earth outside the window. A strand of hair caught in the door jam belonging to someone other than the homeowner. A smudge of lipstick on the inside of the safe door indicating that the robber... Who's kissing the inside of a safe door? Uh, so, so Did palm she, like, two... trip and fall into it like, with her <laughs> lips? I don't know. I don't know. Pa palm 2 is 340 billion parameters. Really? Really. So it's just bad. <laughs> yes. Well, no, it's not that it's bad. It's that it's being trained for for specific tasks, yeah. right? So that that that's where it comes down to doing some prompt engineering and to uh, learn how to give it the prompts necessary to discard the majority of the business training or the code training that it has and get it to focus on the fictional data that it has. Yeah. So this is like, okay, this is a really bad marketing plan too. <laughs> Chat GPT does a better job as well. Well, to be perfectly honest, I mean, like, uh, I like, I have a very hard time getting Palm to do anything else. So, as I'm pretty sure that Palm 
have that like Google is doing the same thing like with Poe. They're wrapping your query in a, in some other specific yeah. This is prompting no, that's focusing it. I would not. I would. Okay, let's see. Running contests and giveaways on social media. If it says raffle copter, I'm going to die. Popular platforms for running contests and giveaways on social Google. media. Google. Wow. <laughs> so generic. Facebook, Twitter. It's not even called Twitter anymore, Google Palm. <laughs> Instagram. Well, Instagram. okay. So this so that's behind the, the times. That's so the other thing. The Remember that the, the, the input data for these models all ends um, back in 2021, 2022, depending on depending which model you're playing with. Yeah. So if you write fiction that is based in the real world or historical and you get back to like the 1950s and back you get pretty good results if you're trying to write modern stuff the more modern you're trying to write the little the the, the more difficult you're gonna, difficulties you're going to have unless you're writing science fiction of which there's a significant amount of pulp science fiction and other stuff that's that's in the system but again it'll be a little purple because again, uh, the, like the, the 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 samples it has is you know HG Wells, yeah. uh, you know stuff you know the stuff that was available in the uh, bibliotech online right. databases and stuff. Mm -hmm. well, I think we can probably do some final thoughts because we're coming up on the hour. And thank you everyone who chimed in. Um, for me, it doesn't matter how big your LLM is. I am not impressed. It's all about the context. <laughs> And how it works. It's all about the training. It's all about the training. Okay, so so we can literally say size doesn't matter. Size it's how you matter. use it. <laughs> it's how you, it's use, how it. you use it. <laughs> all right. Well, this was an absolute joy. I vote we do these more often. And I have a feeling our, our audience and our members on the FFA will as well, because this was just fun. And for those of you watching, um, big shout out to all of our FFA members who are tuning in. And if you're not a member of the FFA, um, you can easily join. There's a three-day free trial. We do these kinds of labs eight eight times a week. So one of us and there's two others of us, just as funny and comedic. And we play <laughs> with the AI live in Zoom. We take uh, members live questions of what they want to try to get done or, or anything like that. Or we also teach on like specific AI tools and also tools of the trade, Vellum, BookBrush, um, Scrivener different things mm -hmm. like that. So it's really kind of turning into this really cool swanky community that is all about publishing profitably with AI as an assistant. And it's really hard to find communities that are doing that right now because so many people are anti-AI and uh, mm -hmm. tough. I'm really tired of being called a thief. Well, so, and, and me too. It's, it's more along the lines <laughs> of they don't know what they're talking about. No, they don't. About. No. Um, and we have a lot of capabilities that, and these systems are just going to get more interesting but you have to learn to use them correctly. Yep. So on that note, thank you all. Uh, I'm Elizabeth and I'll say good night and let everybody else kind of say good night too. I'm Leland. Good night. Good night. I'm Steph. Can't all right. See you guys. Good luck in your writing projects. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Bye.